Welcome to Crime Watch Live from the BBC Television Centre in West London. Your chance to join the fight against crime. Good evening. Over the last few weeks, most of us have been getting back to normal after the Christmas break and New Year. But for two families in Romford in Essex, things will never be the same. And the party was just a typical New Year's Eve party. We've been using the place, must be, for the last eight or ten years, and it's always been a great time down there. Christmas was kind, loving son and brother that anyone could wish to have. He didn't have a malicious bone in his body. He'd always help everyone out. Yeah, she went out the market, got a yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, yeah, it'll be Oh, this one as well, huh? My relationship with Chris was really good. We had a strong relationship. We was together for six months. We was living with each other and we was just really happy and made each other laugh and we was just gonna settle down and like, have a family and stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, it's 2005! About 20 to 2, um, we had like a, an argument, not really anything major, but just like an argument. And um, I just, I left because I wanted to leave and I wanted a bit of air. Chris came over to me and he didn't want me to leave, he didn't want me to go. Dawn! Dawn! Look, Jamie's leaving, come on, sort her out. Please! Chris and his aunt followed Jamie out of the club and onto Ashton Road. It's too dangerous! Just get off me! Look, I'll go and get the key to my house. You can go back there to sort it out. What's the matter with you? They were still shouting at each other and she was still trying to run off. And I went inside the club to find Barry and get the key off of him. Barry! Where have you been? I've been looking for you. Give us the house keys. Chris and Jamie are having an argument outside. Well, why can't they sort it out on their own, eh? When I went out there, they'd crossed over the road down to Bampton Road, Where just opposite. They? Can't you hear them? Even if you can't see them, you can hear them. Tell me what the oh, Look, here's the key. Take the key. What's the matter with you? I'm going home! Uh, uh, it's all right, mate. It's family. We don't need your help. We're sorting it. I think you better get your hands off of me. Oi! Oi! Leave her alone! You better get your bloody hands Leave her alone! Leave her alone! I saw this man and it looked like he was punching Chris in the stomach. He was just staring at me and staring at me. Oh. Oh. Stab her in the chest. Oh. Oi. Chris's Oi. aunt and uncle did everything they could think of to slow down the attacker. I was still having a drink which I brought from the inside out. And I just swung at him and smashed him in the face with it. And it literally shattered on him. And he just didn't flinch. You little shit! So I had my glass in the end, so I threw it. It hit him directly on top of the head. Chris's uncle was stabbed several times himself and even then was chased by the knife man to the end of Bampton Road. Let Where's Kevin? Chris has been stabbed. Where's Kevin? Chris has been stabbed. He's outside. What? He's been stabbed. Found an ambulance. Jamie, I said found a bloody ambulance. My boyfriend's been stabbed. We need an ambulance. Somebody help me, please. What's the matter? What's happened? What's happened? He's been stabbed. Do you want something? You can hear me. Chris. Chris. Every year look forward to Christmas and the New Year, but someone's took something from us now. Chrissy loved Christmas. He used to plaster the house in lights. And 
Christmas or New Year will just never be a celebration for us no more. But the only thing we'll ever celebrate is Chris's life, really. It's left such a such a big hole in our hearts, and I'm not sure we're going to recover. <laughs> Leading the inquiries, DCI Gordon Green. Although Crime Watch UK, by definition, is national, this is very much a Romford, a local inquiry, right? Yeah, it's very much a, a local inquiry, concentrating on the Romford uh, area, Harold Hill area of London. This guy lives there, you think? Because just because that's where he must have been going home after New Year's celebration. Yeah, very much so. We believe he lived in that particular area. or had connections with that area, yes. And the local community has really given you a lot of help. The local community have been superb, and the assistance they've given us throughout this inquiry today has been magnificent. You haven't got much <coughs> of a description. It was it was dark. Everybody had, had a certain amount to drink. But you think he was thinner than the the actor who played the part in our reconstruction? Yeah, thinner than the gentleman in the, in the reconstruction. Well, he, what can you tell us about him? Though? He's late twenties, um, possibly early thirties to mid thirties, about five foot ten, possibly six foot tall in, in height. He had bright light brown hair, to blonde hair with streaks in it, uh, which was swept back from his forehead. And he got a bottle in the face, as we saw. Yeah. We don't know if it cut him. He, I mean, his friends would have noticed a bruise on his, on his cheek the following day, if yeah, nothing some, else. Yeah, somebody must have noticed cuts to the face or, or bruising to the face from being hit with that, uh, that bottle. Now, you've got CCTV from a nearby car park. Yeah. We just selected a still from it here of a guy who was striding away, having slashed the tyres of vehicles. Here's a guy with a knife in the right area at the right time who looks very much like the description. That could be somebody different. It could be someone different. We'd need to identify who this gentleman is. If he knows who he is and he didn't have anything to do with the murder, what's going to happen if he comes forward? With regards to the damage to the motor vehicles, there are many ways we can deal with matters of that nature and prosecution isn't always necessarily one of them. OK, well, if you know who he is, for God's sake, let us know. Uh, he might do this again. Here's our number. It's on the screen. It's a free call. It's good for all our appeals. And here's the incident room. In this case, it's 020-8358-0300. Coming up on tonight's programme... Give me the keys! Give me the keys to the safe now! The armed robbers in Scarborough with an unusual getaway car. We've new evidence on that very English village murder and the locals wondering who amongst them did it. And who says motoring offences aren't really crimes? Help find the killers of five people. But first, some of the breakthroughs since Crime Watch was last on the air. New leads in one of the most horrifying crimes we've ever appealed on. Wayne Trotter was set alight on his way home from work and died in agony. I'm just hoping that somebody out there shows just a little bit of a conscience. We'd shown five items found nearby. Detectives say they've had information which may connect people with three of them. We had dramatic CCTV of a shooting outside a nightclub in Basildon, Essex. Three hours after we went on air, as a direct result, police received an unusual call. A man from Stratford, East London, was arrested the next day and has been charged with attempted murder. More CCTV as a shop was robbed in Thornton Heath, South London. A man handed himself in after seeing Crime Watch and he's been charged with robbery. Anthony Harrington was a wanted face from November's programme. He's appeared at Wirral Crown Court charged with attempted murder and witness intimidation. This is an attempted armed robbery at a bank in Coventry. A Crime Watch viewer called with a name and address. As a direct result, a 19-year-old was arrested at his home. He's already pleaded guilty and is awaiting sentence. An arrest not down to Crime Watch, but with important implications. As you'll have seen, a 15-year-old boy has been charged with attempted murder after a jogger was stabbed in Clissold Park, North London. When we appealed, police had linked it to the murder of American artist Margaret Muller, who'd been jogging in Victoria Park in Hackney. They're now convinced Margaret Muller's killer is still at large. And today, police appealed in particular to someone who called Crime Stoppers three months ago and named an individual. Please get in touch with Crime Stoppers or the police urgently. Now, when you think of a getaway car, a reliant Robin isn't the first model that comes to mind. And that's what detectives believe two robbers used in Scarborough in Yorkshire last October and November. Their Del Boy Kai might be a bit of a joke, but their attacks are anything but. Oh, 
worked at Superdrug for about six, seven months. Well, I walked down the high street at the shop um, and I passed uh, a girl with short cropped hair. When I got to the shop, I turned the alarms off as soon as I got in, then turned the light on and then went to put the bin outside, big industrial bin we have. on the floor, he wouldn't let me get up. He was just just kicking me all the time, wanting to know where these safe keys were. Where's the key? I saw somebody else going to the office. Tell me where the keys are to the safe! Where are the keys? I don't know! And I could hear all uh, the noise going in the office. Tell me where the keys are to the safe! I don't know where I are! I don't have the keys to the safe! He had a, like a tuft of hair. It could have been in a ponytail. It was blonde on the top, but it was darker underneath. Tell me where the keys are! No! Get up! Get up! Use your hands! Don't hurt me! Shut up! Please don't hurt me! Got it! Go! Go! <laughs> I didn't dare move at first. I just felt totally, utterly sick. Call the police. We've been robbed. They're animals. They're not human beings. They can't be. I cannot believe how people can be so cruel, so so violent. I could have understood it if I'd been fighting back, but I didn't. I just laid there, and and, and it was like an animal. A month later, again in Scarborough, just before lunch, a hotel employee spotted something unusual. As I pulled in the car park, I realised that these two guys that were sat in this car were actually watching what I was doing. I got the shopping out of the boot. They were still watching me. As I walked down, I realised this car had mirrored windows at the back of it. At the time they were parked there was very odd. It's very quiet this time of year out there. My main concern was that they were actually watching the hotel. A little later at the nearby Plaza Cinema, the projectionist was opening up for the afternoon show. Where's the keys for the safe? Where's the keys for the safe? I haven't got the keys to the safe. Get on the floor! <laughs> on the floor! <laughs> Where are the keys to the safe? The, the manager's got them. What, you, what are these keys here? What no, are these for? They can't be open the doors. Where's the safe? It's back that way. Wait, well, give us the keys, give us the keys! <laughs> <laughs> Sit. Please don't hurt me. Please don't. What time does a manager ask get here? About 1.15. I can hear someone. I didn't know what he wanted at first. I thought I was going to either be raped or beaten. Stand up! No, I think it was the worst no, thing, not knowing no, what was going to happen to me. No! No! Oh, God, no! Please don't put me in the cupboard! No! Please don't hurt me! No! Please, let me out, please! Please! It was the worst time. I think I was too scared to get my phone because I could hear him breathing behind the door. Please, you're not going to kill me, are you, please? I could hear them opening their rucksack, putting the money inside, whispering to each other. Um, I think they were panicking, trying to rush to get out. <laughs> get out! Come on, move! <laughs> Sit down there! <laughs> Please! Come on, come on! That'll do, that'll do! 
Arthur, come on! Oh. <laughs> they might be laughing now because they've got money, but the effect that they have on other people, it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. DC Ray Roberts is leading the investigation. Ray, it's an unusual crime, this in Scarborough, because of the level of violence. Yes, it's a very accurate reconstruction of the events of uh, those two robberies, and uh, it shows the offenders had no regards for what the victims went through. Actually, uh, the lady at the Superdrug was very badly beaten, and uh, two of the three victims have been unable to go to work since the incident, and it's had a devastating effect on their lives. And of course, the second time a gun was involved. I mean, what do you know about this pair? Well, they, they do appear to be from uh, not local. Uh, they certainly the aggressive one has a Geordie accent or northeast accent, uh, and we think these are well-planned crimes that uh, they obviously have targeted these two premises and, uh, and committed these vicious crimes. From the super drug robbery, these, these vouchers like these were taken. These uh, ten, five pound, one pound vouchers, and some telephone vouchers as well. Where are these likely to have ended up? Yes, well, super drug vouchers uh, are used just in the super drug stores. There's a large amount, a thousand pounds worth of those. So, if anybody's been offered any large amounts uh, for sale, we would be interested to find out where they were sold. Also, there's three thousand pounds of telephone vouchers. So again. If anybody's been if offered a large been offered amount, those, yeah. we need to know about them as soon as we can. What about the Reliant Robin? Unusual choice of getaway car, as we were saying, but distinctive. Yes, yes, it's certainly a silver or a grey one, and it had mirrored windows at the back, which is uh, quite unusual. So uh, we need to know who owns that vehicle or who is using it on that day, uh, and hopefully uh, we can uh, eliminate them from our inquiries. I suppose it's just possible they may have taken that mirrored bit off now. Yes, that might have been removed. It's uh, two months ago now, so it might have been removed, but certainly anybody with a, such a distinctive car we need to know about. OK, well, there's a £5,000 reward incidentally put up by Superdrug. Call us now on 0500 600 600 or call the incident room on 01609 789 452. And now here's DC Jackie Hames. Crimes in a shop, a tube train, a bank and a garage all feature in this month's CCTV. First, an armed robbery in Southall, West London. Three men enter a local convenience store. One is armed with a knife, another a baseball bat. Here's the money. Here's the money. Here's the money. Here's the money. One goes behind the counter, you can hear the other two calling his name. They only manage to escape with just two bottles of booze. Who is Amit and who are the other two? Staying in London, this time on the underground, three men board a Northern Line train and harass and attack a passenger. Further down the carriage, another passenger tries to help, but he's then set on himself. He's been left with a broken nose and severe bruising to his face. So who's the man in the check jumper? And who are his companions? Now, a branch of Lloyd's TSB in Hereford. A woman wearing a dark trouser suit hands over a fake banker's card and asks for £1,000 in cash. The staff suspect her and she leaves the bank empty-handed. Who is she? And a shell garage in Hickstead, West Sussex. Two men walk into the shop. One lingers by the door while the other buys a packet of cigarettes. He then grabs a member of the public and manhandles him towards a security door, hoping to get to the till. When he can't get the door open, he jumps over the counter, forces open the till and escapes with a bundle of cash. Do you recognise the robber in his distinctive sports jacket and black hat? 0500 600 if you can help with any of those cases. It's 20 past nine, we're live of course, if you don't think you can solve a major crime. What about a driving offence? Each year around 900 people are killed in all the categories of homicide added together in the United Kingdom, but almost four times that number are killed by motorists, an average of 70 deaths every week. It's all very well to say that motoring offences don't really matter. Some of them of course are downright criminal and tonight we want your help in identifying three killers. First, the driver who helped turn a car like this into this. Inside were Rachel Turk, her son Jack, who was six, her daughter Emily, who was eight, and Rachel's new husband, Richie. Rachel, Jack and Richie were all killed. It's so appalling that Thames Valley Police have put up a £5,000 reward. 
Were you on the A4130 between Henley-on-Thames and Wallingford on a Sunday at the end of September last year? Do you remember an old-style red mini? It either had a white roof or, at any rate, white stripes on the bonnet. And do you know who was driving it? Overtaking recklessly and causing a Subaru to swerve and crash into the Turk's Toyota. This is Jenny Plenty, who lost her daughter, son-in-law and grandson in the smash. Thank God your granddaughter, Emily, survived, the eight-year-old. Yes. How is she now? She's coping. She went through three ops, four, maybe four ops. She last had her last op about a month ago, just before Christmas. She removed the pins out of her leg and the steel plate in her arm. She has the remaining plate in her wrist because that has to stay for the rest of her life, hence that every time she grows, she has to have it replaced. And emotionally, how is she coping? She's my darling. She... She's fine. She hasn't cried, 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 not as if I know of. But when she's with me and she's quiet, I say, you all right, my Emily? Yes, Nanny. And she's quick to the point. Then I leave her alone and I leave her time to think. And I know she's thinking of her mummy. You have campaigned ceaselessly to find who the driver of the Mini was. Yes. Why? Um, I need some answers, not only for my family, but for Victoria, Phil, and Matthew, and Brian and I. Part of the jigsaw is missing, and I need to finish the jigsaw. Supposing one of his friends is watching this, knows who it is, and thinks, well, he didn't actually deliberately kill anybody. This was an accident. What is the point now of him, of him coming forward? How, what would you say to that view? I would say, please do, please do so, so I can come to terms with the loss of my three darling family, part of the family. Perhaps it wasn't his fault, but he does know, or any witnesses that were at the scene, whether it be small or whether it be minor, please, please, as a grandmother and a mother, please come forward. All right, Jane, if, uh, if you were the driver of that red mini, for God's sake, give us a call now, 0500 600 600. Or as Jenny says, if you witnessed that accident but haven't yet come forward because you don't think your evidence was all that important, just give us a call. Got any information at all, 0500 600 600 or Thames Valley Police on 01993 88 6535. And you own a van like this, or you know who had one last October. Very late one Friday night, three months ago, Martin McDonough stopped his car on a motorway hard shoulder to inspect some damage. Somehow, another vehicle hit him and didn't stop. The impact was severe enough to kill Martin, but the driver left behind this telltale piece of evidence. This comes from one of these, a Nissan Irvan. And you work in a body shop, which sometime in the last few months has replaced a left-hand wing mirror. Or do you know anyone who's got a van where this mirror is still missing? Do you know anyone who sold their van in the last few weeks? Or did you witness what happened that night on the M40 westbound, just after Oxford services and before Bista Turnoff Junction 9? It was 12.30 a.m. just into the morning of Saturday, the 11th of October. Our number's on the screen, or once again, you can call Thames Valley Police on 01993 If you're a biker, you'll probably recognise this as a Honda VFR 400. This one belonged to 20-year-old Joe Cave. One Friday last June, he and his girlfriend Dominique were travelling home from Rygate in Surrey, heading east on the M25. Just after Junction 6 at Godston, a car came up beside the bike, matching its speed in the outside lane, and seemed to be toying with it. Joe was rather anxious about what was going on, and just before Clackett Lane services, he tried to move away towards the slow lane, but he collided with a van. He was killed. Thankfully, Dominique on the back survived. Witnesses say that that car provoked the accident. It was a Ford Focus or something similar, perhaps an estate, we're not sure. Probably champagne, or at any rate, a light colour, maybe silver. And the start of its registration could be GX51 or GK51. There were two men inside that car, one of whom was sticking his tongue out and laughing at Joe and Dominique. 
we think this is what he looks like. Joe was so funny. He was really loud. He was laid back. You know, you could talk to him about anything and he would understand. Um, everybody loved him because of his sense of humour, his personality. He was just so nice. Since Joe's death, we've been absolutely devastated. We miss him so very, very much. We didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. And I just want the people that are, that were concerned with this to come forward, um, help bring an end to our pain. In fact, there may have been lots of witnesses to events that led up to this crash. It was 5 p.m., quite a long time ago, Friday the 27th of June, but you'd remember it. Call us here, 0500 600 600, or Surrey Police Direct on 0845 125 222. It's been called a very English murder. In fact, it's almost an Agatha Christie, Miss Marple. An elderly lieutenant colonel is shot on the doorstep of his cottage in a picturesque village, and the police say the killer is almost certainly from the locality. You'll have seen it on the news. Retired Army officer Robert Workman, known locally as Riley, was shot at point blank. Villagers here are appalled and angry over the manner of there Mr. Was no Workman's theft, death. no apparent motive. Contact them as soon as possible. Robert Hall, BBC News. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News, Hertfordshire. Victim was 83-year-old Robert Workman from Ferno Pelham in Hertfordshire. He was killed with a shotgun. Many of the locals do have shotgun licences, but the voice on a 999 call has not yet been identified. Tonight, we can play you a cleaned-up version of the tape, which removes some of the background noise, to focus on the voice. Hello, caller. Hello. Hello. The ambulance service, what's the... Do you want the ambulance to come to? Ambulance? It's Holly Hart Cottage. Holly? Holly Hart Cottage. Can you spell it for me? H-O-L-L-Y. Yeah. C-O-C-K. And what road is it on? It's the causeway. The causeway? Yes. In what town? That's the Phoenix Pelham. Can you spell that for me? F U R N E A U X P U R. That is the Sierra. F U R N E A U X Pelham P G L H A M. Stand with me a moment. That's near Bantingside. This is Detective Superintendent Richard Mann, who's leading the inquiry. You've got new evidence to reveal on Crime Watch tonight. Yes, we have. What we've not released before tonight is actually the type of ammunition that was used. It's this, this that we can see here. That's right. It's a 12 bore shotgun cartridge, but more importantly, the size of the load is in fact an SG size load, and there are nine fairly large pellets within the cartridge. It's not particularly common, it's fairly specialist, and it's not widely used. It's the type of um, cartridge that would be used for the destruction of fairly large animals, such as deer, and may be used by a, a gamekeeper or a landowner. So what you're after tonight is anyone who knows someone who uses this kind of cartridge? Anyone who uses that type of cartridge in the Ferno Pelham area, or anyone who uses that type of cartridge that may have connections with Lieutenant Colonel Riley Workman. Now, what about a motive? you any clearer as to that? No, we're not. The motive is still very unclear. Um, that's why we've released pictures tonight of Lieutenant Colonel Workman as a younger man. It may be that someone now recognises him from those photos as a younger man, and they may be able to help us understand why anyone would want to kill him. Possibly setting an old score in his past, perhaps? Possibly. There could be some distant, dark secret in his past that we're not aware of. So if anyone has any information as to why anyone would want to kill him, then please call us. What about that voice on the tape, the 999 call? What do you make of that? It's very significant. We've appealed for that person who made the call to come forward, and as yet they've chosen not to. Oh, yeah. The call was made um, three and a half miles away, some eight to nine hours after the murder took place. It's a very distinctive voice, and we need to speak to the person who made that call. So if anyone can identify the person who made that call, then please phone us. OK, well, listen to that voice one last time and call us back if you can help. Mr Parton. Hello, caller. Hello. The ambulance service. What's the address you want the ambulance to come to? Ambulance. It's Holly Hart Cottage. Holly. Holly Hart Cottage. Can you spell it for me? H O L L Y. Yeah. C O C K. And what road is it on? It's the causeway. 
Call us here on 0500 600 600 or call Heart for Chicken Stabulary on 01992 533 174. Or visit their website to listen to that call again. That's www.hearts.police.uk. Here's Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. Uh, I've just been checking on calls on those two robberies in Scarborough, um, one at Superdrag and one at the cinema, um, where the level of violence was extreme and totally unnecessary. Now, we've had one caller to say that the vouchers, the Superdrag vouchers, are, are um, on eBay, and we've had lots of calls about the Robin Reliant. Only one that talks about it being in Scarborough and that it's silver, so we'll definitely be following that, that, that one up. Any information, please keep calling. And the murder in Romford on New Year's Eve, very, very distressing for all the family. We've So far, we've had five names given. Three of them actually have the first, the, the same first name, although different surnames. Um, so that could be interesting. But um, two people have said they can identify the attacker and they recognise him as a local man, which is what we think. And there's an army barracks nearby, which may be significant. So if that helps you identify him, please call. The studio number is on the screen. And if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Crime Watch. Still to come. Bugger, bugger. What's going on? The daylight robbery in North Wales with literally unspeakable consequences. The mummy they thought was a man but who turned out to be a woman. Now we need to find anyone who knew her. And if you saw a crime taking place, how could a witness would you make? We'll put you to the test. Beachy Head in East Sussex is well known as a beauty spot, but uh, tragically, it's also rather well known for suicides. And 11 days ago, no fewer than three bodies were spotted at the foot of the cliffs there. It turned out that two of the deaths were not suspicious, probably suicides in fact, but a third had been horribly murdered. He was found tied and taped up. He'd been stabbed, put in a plastic barrel and dumped over the edge. Who is he? Leading the inquiry is DCI Tony O'Donnell. You've got a computer-generated picture of him. Just describe him for us. Yes, he's um, five foot nine. He's slim build, and you can just see um, he has a scar above his right eyebrow. And he had special dental work done, apparently. Yes, that's correct. He he had an upper dental plate, um, four front teeth, and two on either side, so it's half his teeth effectively. And was it done in this country? Is he likely to be British? The the, the work appears to be British, and um, it's a couple of years old at least. What about his clothes? He brought his... a mannequin with uh, with facsimiles. Yes, um, his clothes. It was a CS Active um, top, which can be bought in Primark, and so we know all about that. Underneath, however, um, we have what is a Groove Armada love box hooded top. Uh, this is actually an unauthorised reproduction and um, as is the top underneath which is a green, yellowy green pen sports t-shirt. He, he was wrapped, it was reported he was wrapped in a curtain as well. Yes, um, it was actually wrapped in a double uh, bed sheet. With it was a bed sheet? Yes, it was a Valens bed sheet. Actually um, rather distinctive. Yes, that's correct, it's a, a very distinctive pattern. And with quite a distinctive label as well. Yes. A cord, do you recognise that? Now, the barrel, we've got a very similar one here rather than the original one. And those are actually pretty common, aren't they? Yes, they are. We know the barrel came from Italy. We know it was made four years ago, so we know all about the barrel. It's whether you can connect the barrel to the clothing and to the, to the image. There's been all sorts of speculation that uh, this was involved with drugs and all this, but there's absolutely no evidence. I mean, you've got fingerprints from the corpse. I don't think you've found anything on the criminal records. Yes, we have fingerprints, we have DNA. Um, he's not known in this country as a criminal. And yet, was absolutely, horribly murdered. I mean, really grotesque. He was stabbed a number of times in, in the, the head and face, in the body. He was tied up, trussed up, put in this barrel and thrown um, over 500 feet down a cliff. Look, somebody's got to know who he is. Please, call us now, 0500 600 600 or Sussex Police, direct to the incident room on 01273 859 511. Now, we're live, it's 9.35, we've got a lot of calls coming in. Let me tell you about one in particular. Do you remember we were talking about Rachel and Richie Turk and their children, Emily and Jack? Uh, Rachel and uh, Rick, Ricky and Jack were killed in that car accident. We heard from the grandmother, Jenny Plenty. We've had one really important call, someone who says they were the driver of that red Mini. Now, if that's a serious call, please call back. The call either dropped out or or the person put the phone down. We've got written down here, male voice, northern accent. If that was a serious call, please call back. 
Now to another mystery, and one that goes back 15 years, but at last it's slowly unravelling. A mystery with a mummified body, a missing teenager, and a chance remark. Detectives in Leeds are examining missing persons files to try and identify the body of a man. David Hurst reports. The body was discovered by a workman in the Allerton Park area of Leeds yesterday morning. It had been dumped in undergrowth in the grounds of a nursing home. Until we know a cause of death, we, we don't really know what we've got. Uh, but we, it's really important to identify this person. 13 years on, Philip Revel Johnson has been promoted, but he still keeps an eye on the case. Well, this is Allerton Park, the street. It's a residential street, and this area here has completely been uh, renovated, and all these buildings are brand new. Uh, in 1991, this was a, a wall with a fence along it, and uh, the body was found on this side, behind the fence. Unusually, the corpse was mummified, which means it was old, but hadn't fully decomposed. It was quite apparent that the body had been dead for quite some time. Uh, pathologists notoriously uh, find it very difficult to tell you exactly how long, and we started the inquiry off on the grounds that it was at least six months old. Uh, privately, we thought it was probably quite a lot longer than that. Well, mummification isn't a process that's going to occur very quickly. I think you're probably looking at, at months rather than weeks, if not years. And the body must have been stored in, an, in a dry, warm environment after death. We're confident that the body's been kept inside a building of some description. And it's obvious that somebody's had some need to move that body. But until we identified the body, we had no real starting point. The initial pathologist's report indicated that uh, the individual was male. And my understanding is that the reason for that is that uh, the uterus was absent. And the, the uterus is actually a very muscular tissue and tends to be one of the last tissues of the body to decompose. So in its absence, one might assume that the body was male. So this was the line police had to pursue when on Valentine's Day in 1991, they asked Crime Watch viewers for help. Perhaps you'll recognise him from this model of his face, reconstructed from his skull. He was white, probably in his 20s, 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 6, with an average build, and light brown or ginger hair. Well, the pathologist's findings about the sex of the body surprised us initially, because uh, the general uh, demeanour of everything seemed that it pointed to being a female. Uh, there was the earring, there was the, uh, the sweater that uh, was being worn. Uh, it was only some weeks after that that we decided to start again and look at all female missing people as well. Pathologists and anthropologists studying the remains at Sheffield University also began to have their doubts. When one looks at the skeleton, uh, it really is almost unequivocally female looking. Men tend to have very pronounced brow ridges on the skull and this individual really has hardly any brow ridging at all. The other site that we look at is the pelvis. Uh, we can look at the angle at which the two halves of the pelvis join together, and you can see that that angle is probably slightly wider than 90 degrees, which again is a clearly female trait. A number of experts have looked at the skeleton over the years, forensic pathologists, anthropologists and dentists, and we're quite confident that we're dealing with a, a white female of below average height in her late teens or early 20s. Other experts tried modelling the victim's face. Each was different, but there were striking similarities. But no missing person seemed to match. Then, in 1995, the Bradford Telegraph and Argus appealed for a teenager to come home. Donna Healy had vanished in 1988. When Donna was younger, she was happy, go lucky girl. Then she got into bad company and she just went off the rails. And there was nothing we could do. We always thought she'd come to her senses and come home. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. The last time her family saw Donna was actually on her 18th birthday when Donna turned up out of the blue at her family home. It was a few days later that Donna appeared at court in Leeds on a prostitution charge. There was no reason at this stage to connect the mummified body with missing Donna. Donna's last movements were a mystery, and all the girls who'd worked with her as prostitutes had moved on. Only a year ago was Donna's disappearance reviewed. It was then that a connection was made, and even then, by chance. A detective who knew about the mummified body happened to overhear a conversation about Donna. 
He told D.I. Chris Binns, who was reviewing Donna's case. Chris Binns rang me last year. He discussed uh, this missing from home with me. And all the details he gave me and all the description that he gave me all seemed to fit. And he sent me some photographs of reconstruction of the figure of the head of this unidentified body. And I, I was immediately struck by the remarkable resemblance to, to the photographs that I had of Donna. But the only way to conclusively prove that was through DNA. At the time this case originated, uh, the sort of materials we could use for DNA profiling would generally include um, blood and body fluids and fresh tissue samples. Under the circumstances of this body, highly mummified, very degraded, those techniques uh, just didn't give us profiles. Uh, but last year, using the latest techniques, we were able to actually get profiles. Donna Healy disappeared from her home in Bradford in 1988. Three years later, a woman's body was found in Leeds. But only this week, thanks to advances in DNA science, was it positively identified as Donna. So at least a peace of mind where she is. I would just like to know why now. Donna was only 18. If you knew her, don't let her down. If you were friends and knew where she went and who she hung around with, if you worked in the streets of Chapeltown when she did in 1988, if you had any worries about any of the punters who used to go there 15 years ago, or if anyone's spoken to you about Donna or what happened to her, D.I. Crispins promises he and his team will use the greatest discretion. We owe it to Donna, but if, as seems likely, it was murder, we owe it to each other to make sure the killer isn't free to do it again. Chris and his team are here on free call 0500 600 600 and his colleagues are standing by in Bradford on 01274 376 915. Now, here's Jeremy. I have four more faces for you to take a look at this month and I'll be very pleased to hear if you know any of them. This is Jonathan Richmond. He's said to look a bit like Duncan Goodhue, though he's usually dressed in jeans and cowboy boots. He's wanted for fraud offences and for making threats to kill. Now, he sent one victim live bullets, including this one, and detectives are worried about what he might do next. Be on the lookout, especially at expensive hotels in central London, where he may check in under false names and pay with stolen credit cards. Now, detectives want to talk to Shaquille Razak about an attempted murder in Halifax, West Yorkshire, last July. The victim was shot twice, stabbed twice and stunned with an electric cattle prod. In fact, he was lucky to survive. It's believed Shaquille Razak may be in Luton or in nearby Dunstable. And Isaac Price is wanted in connection with a series of violent robberies on pensioners in the Ludlow area of Shropshire. In one of the attacks, just four weeks ago, an 81-year-old woman had her leg broken in two places. Isaac Price is described as having a big beer gut which hangs out over his trousers. He's also an escapee from prison and should be serving a sentence for burglary. He comes from Staffordshire and is part of a travelling community, so he could be anywhere tonight. And this is her show Yoon, also known as Si Moy, which means little sister. Last September, a man was kidnapped, held in a North London flat and badly beaten with a baseball bat. Detectives want to talk to Seymour in connection with the attack and also about immigration offences. There's a £5,000 reward if you can lead police to an arrest. Call us 0500 600 600 if you've seen any of these four people and if you know someone who has information about Seymour and is a Mandarin speaker, they can call the special incident room at Scotland Yard on 0207 230 4583. We're going to show you some stolen items in a moment, things you might have been offered, or maybe actually bought in good faith. But first, look at how they were obtained. We're going to the home of Ken and Alice Williams in Colwyn Bay on a Thursday afternoon back in September. Alice and I have been married for 45 happy years. Alice has had Parkinson's disease for five years, so she doesn't let it affect our life at all. We enjoy potting around in the garden and doing things around the house. We enjoy our two little dogs, Molly and Scamp, and we just enjoy life together. Come on. Come on, then. Thanks, love. 
How are you getting on? Already cut that hedge. I've made a quiche and a salad for tea tonight. Lovely. How have the dogs been? Fine, they've been keeping me company. Maybe giving them a few tidbits. No, you shouldn't, you know. You don't want them to get too fat after taking a And we have a little line by the conservatory, which didn't give us a clear view of the conservatory door, where this chap must have come through. And the burglar took medals, which belonged to me, which I had for serving out in Malaya. Jewellery, not of great value, but sentimental to Aylis. I'd uh, better get on now. All right, love. snapped. There was no way she was going to let him get away with this. She grabbed him, they tussled. She was cut, was pushed and pulled, and she fell heavily down the concrete stairs. Help me! <laughs> I should have been there to help her. We've been up the garden and not been able to hear. I knew nothing about it. Still feel guilty now. You know, because she'd been there, especially with being there for three quarters of an hour before she was found. Help! Help me! Help me! Help me! Help me! I'll get Mum. No, no, stay with me. I'll be fast. First I knew is when my daughter came to the front door and asked me to come across because they thought that Alice had fallen. When I took a deeper look at her, I thought, there's more to this than just falling over, really. <laughs> what happened? A boy man in the house. Oh. It's getting guarded. <laughs> My first instinct was that somebody was still in the house, so I asked Alice, is somebody still in the house? And she said, and she waved at me to say that, no, he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Get Ken! <laughs> when I see Alice oh now, she looks tired some days, and I ask her, does she manage to get sleep during the day? She shakes her head. She can't possibly close her eyes, because every time she closes her eyes, she just sees his face and what he did to her. Well, this attack is certainly made a difference to Alice's Parkinson's. She shakes a lot more now. She hasn't got any movement in her right legs and is now housebound. I'll call the police. She hasn't had back any speech at all since it happened. Alice is so angry about what this man has done to our lives just for a few stolen goods. It's not just Alice that's uh, so angry, as you'll hear in a moment. But just in case you know the knife man, he was in his early to mid-twenties, medium-length dark hair, he had very bad teeth and bad breath, and he had a pierced right eyebrow with a bar through it. In fact, he had very, very thick eyebrows, which met in the middle. Alice thinks her act is a pretty good likeness. He wore Nike vocal trainers like these. These, incidentally, were never sold in, in Europe, only in the United States and Asia and take a look at the sort of things that he stole. Firstly, like this. This is a, 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 another medal, identical to one that was, to, was taken. It's, it's a Malaya medal with this uh, purple, green, purple striping. And also a, a, a money box, which is uh, shaped rather like a, a post box like that. Have you been offered that? DC Dave Brennan and colleagues from North Wales Police are waiting for your call. And Dave, I said that other people were angry. There is a rumour that local criminals are so incensed that they themselves have put up a reward. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's right, but uh, the amount hasn't been confirmed. Alice was actually quite badly cut by him. Yeah, she was very brave. Um, she received uh, in excess of 25 knife wounds to her arms, chest and face. 
the, the, you don't think the guy is local. This, this phrase, bugger, bugger, I wonder if somebody recognised that rather unusual thing to say, wouldn't you? It's very unusual, especially for the Colwyn Bay area. What's your best hope of solving this to Crime Watch? He's not going to ring up. Well, hopefully. Um, maybe he's mentioned it to a friend or a member of family or even to a cellmate that he shared uh, since the incident. Well, if so, please give us a call. Our studio number's on the screen. And uh, more of DC Brennan's colleagues are at the Instant Room in Colwyn Bay on 01492 510 And don't forget, if you've been the victim of crime, you want to talk to somebody, the victim support line is on 0845 30 30 900. Just gone 10 to 10. Keep your calls coming in because we've had good results on Crime Watch lately. In fact, so many we can't go through all of them in great detail. But all of these people have been convicted as a result of your calls, and most of them have been given long terms in prison. George Sherlock was arrested in Sheffield after a viewer called in giving the address of the building site where he was working. He was convicted on 13 counts of indecent assault and was sent down for seven years. Beverly Fern, over here, turned out, uh, turned out to be the woman with a child who was caught on camera opening a bank account under a false name. A viewer gave us her name and address and a search uncovered documents that linked her to a gang that was conning elderly people out of their investments. Beverly Fern was given 18 months suspended and Paul Godby and John Henderson got six years, nine months between them. Mark Sharpless was arrested after we showed a reconstruction of an elderly man being beaten so badly he lost his sight in one eye. A viewer gave his name and he's now serving 27 months for GBH. And Adrian Heslop's girlfriend recognised him on Crime Watch robbing a Bristol jeweller's. She told him if he didn't hand himself in, she would go to the police herself. So reluctantly, he did, and he's been sentenced to three years for robbery and theft. Andrew Crichton was a face that we showed in October 2001. He's a sex offender from Swansea who skipped bail and was on the run for 16 months. A viewer agonised over whether the man she knew was Andrew and eventually phoned with his address. When he heard the police had been to his house, he handed himself in. He was sentenced to eight and a half years for rape. So, you can see, your calls really do make a difference. It's uh, amazing on Crime Watch how much detail some people remember. A face or something that happened weeks, months or even years ago. Yet other times we're told definitely a car was red, it turns out to have been blue. But if you ever see something dramatic or suspicious, there are things that you can do to make your memory more reliable. Here's Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. So to see if you make a good witness, take a look at what's happening here, and then I'll pose some questions to you. Right, and it was just a peck on the cheek. We were together for five years. I've seen him for two years. Now, if you were a bystander, how much of that information would you be able to retain? So, from what you've seen, test yourself with these questions. So, how many people were involved in the robbery? And what sex were they? There was one man and one woman, two people. There were two people who ran out of those doors, a guy and a girl. Um, I'd say there were about five. There was the two guys, a um, guy who took the bat, there's three guys, and, and two ladies, I think. In fact, two people were directly involved in the robbery, one male and one female. But what about more specific details? The guy was wearing tracksuit bottoms and trainers. That's about all. And the girl had a, a beige cap on, and the guy was also carrying um, a black handbag. Um, I remember the woman was wearing a hat, but aside from that, not really. Good. The girl was wearing a cap and a hooded top, and the boy was thin, dark hair, and was about 5 foot 11. Now, it's always a good idea when trying to estimate height to compare with another object, perhaps a doorway or even a poster stand. Did you manage to get any information about the vehicle? It was blue and quite... A quite a kind of, it was dark but quite, it was quite shiny, it looked like quite a new car. Um, and from this side the registration looked like it was something like MGX. And I looked at the back, my eyesight's not fabulous so I, I may have misread it, on the back it looked like it could have been something slightly different. Now if there's a car involved we need three pieces of information. We need the registration number, we need the make and the colour of the car. So can you spot which is the guilty couple? 
It's not as easy as it seems. And even more difficult weeks later at an ID parade when they're wearing very different clothes. If you can, write down what you saw immediately. Don't talk to anyone else about it before you do. Surprisingly, it can alter the way you remember things. Regardless of how small, don't leave out any details, even if they don't seem important. But don't feel you should remember more than you can. If you're not sure, then say so. For example, it's better to say something happened between two points in time rather than try to give us an exact time, which may be wrong. And finally, always please come forward to help. Your information could make all the difference. Of course, some people don't just come forward, they have a go. And all credit goes to one shopper who, despite seeing our notices when we were filming that, still thought it was so realistic it had to be a genuine robbery. Take a look at the girl with the hat as she smashes the bag. The boy then runs off with it and a good Samaritan intervenes, much to the bewilderment of the actress. Well, good for him, if only uh, more of us were so public-spirited. I'll say, Nala, we're almost out of time, but let me just tell you about the calls we've had coming in. We've had a very good response on the Romford murder. Remember, that was outside a nightclub. Several names have come in, an address now as well. Uh, information that uh, this person might have links with a minicab firm. And one really good call uh, from someone who says they know this person very well. The police will call you straight back. And let me just tell you, we had a lot of calls on the Southall uh, armed robbery. A police officer who, who says he overheard the person bragging about it. Um, relatives, close relatives of the Southall, Aspect. and we're narrowing down the area where he might live uh, in North London. Uh, let me just remind you again, I appealed on this earlier, I'm just going to appeal again if the call was serious. The driver of the red Mini, uh, an accident that almost wiped out the Turk family, leaving just Emily, who was, uh, who was eight, surviving. If that was you, if that was a serious call, please do call back. We're getting a lot of calls on other cases. We'll fill you up, uh, fill you up, we'll fill you in on those later on. All the incident room numbers are on CFAX on page 621. You can see a reminder of some of tonight's cases and crime prevention advice on our website at www.bbc.co.uk slash crime. Our phone, phone lines are open uh, for a couple of hours yet uh, and indeed from 7.30 a.m. until midnight tomorrow. We'll be back in just over an hour at 11.05 with Crime Watch Update. Now, next month, proof you should keep your savings in a bank, not under your mattress. The fortune in cash stolen from home and the owner who met a grisly end because of it. Crime Watch will be on Thursday. That's Thursday, the 26th of February. With the help and goodwill of Crime Watch viewers, let's hope that the crimes that we've featured tonight are now well on their way to being solved. So don't have nightmares. Sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>